our turnout was a bit higher than expected, so our apologies to um, uh, the folks in, in the way back who may not have a seat, um, but we hope you'll hang with us. Um, my name is Jennifer Cook, and I direct the Africa program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I want to welcome you all to CSIS, and it's, it's really wonderful to see the level of interest in today's event, which is on the big outcomes of President Obama's recent trip to Africa, and in particular on the Power Africa initiative that he announced. Uh, today's event is part of the Chevron Forum on Development. This is a series of speaker events and part of a larger uh, initiative here at CSIS under the leadership of our U.S. Uh, Leadership and Development Program, which is co-directed by Johanna Nesseth, who is probably here, uh, and Dan Rundy, um, that looks at the role of the private sector in development, how U.S. development assistance can harness the energy of the private sector and ma maximize development impacts. So we're, we're very grateful to the Chevron Corporation for their important support. I'd also really like to thank Christina Perkins of CSIS, who's done a great job and worked very hard to bring this big event together today. As most of you know, President Obama traveled to Africa from June 25th to June 3rd, uh, visiting Senegal, Tanzania, and South Africa. This was his first trip to the region since a brief visit to Ghana in 2009. And the trip, uh, the initiatives that he announced, and I think the very warm reception that he received uh, in Africa, um, presents a real opportunity to re-energize uh, U.S. partnerships on the continent and to engage African governments, uh, ent entrepreneurs, and citizens, I think, in a new and different way. Uh, the President spoke of this paradigm shift in U.S. relations with Africa that moves the U.S. away from thinking of the continent um, as a, a place of disease and conflict and need to one with much greater emphasis on economic growth, investment in trade, and sustained development. I think this entails a major shift that is beginning not entirely there in a mindset, I think, both in the U.S. and in Africa, uh, where perceptions of uh, pursuit of commercial interests and profit, there's always been something seen as slightly unseemly about that when you talk about Africa. Uh, but I think now we're moving to the idea that, in fact, these commercial ties, if managed well, can help drive growth, employment, development, and enduring ties of mutual interest. And this is welcome, uh, I think, here in the U.S., but particularly among an up-and-coming generation of, of Africans. On June 30th in Tanzania, the President announced the Power Africa Initiative. And this is a signature element of this new paradigm shift uh, that aims to tackle one of the major drags on the well-being of African populations and communities, particularly in rural areas. Uh, perhaps the greatest obstacle to Africa's continued economic growth and a huge barrier for potential investors looking to engage in Africa, and that's access to reliable and affordable electricity. Uh, the President's focus on energy is extremely important, uh, and the hope is that this initiative gains in momentum and gets the holding power needed to be truly transformative. Uh, so I think the turnout today attests to the enthusiasm and excitement that the initiative has generated. Uh, there's leadership and bipartisan support in Congress uh, to tackle this issue with Chairman Royce, uh, Congressman Engel, Congressman Smith, Congresswoman Bass introducing legislation, the Electrify uh, Africa Act of 2013. And there's huge receptivity in Africa as well. So this is really an important opportunity and it's, it's important that we make the most of this. We're very happy to have with us today Andrew Herskowitz, who is newly appointed as coordinator for both the Power Africa Initiative and the Trade Africa Initiative. Uh, Andrew most recently served as AID's mission director in Ecuador, uh, as deputy director in Peru, um, and previously with the Office of Development Credit, which leverages private sector funds um, through its Development Credit Authority uh, program. Andrew has a major task ahead of him. He's going to be based in Nairobi. He's going to be, have to coordinate the many agencies involved in this initiative, uh, and we want to see him succeed and the initiative succeed. We're going to hear from Andrew um, on the broad parameters uh, of the initiative. Uh, what's new? What should we be looking for to gauge progress? Uh, what are the big challenges as he sees them? We're then going to take a few questions, and at two, he has an important commitment. We'll turn to our panel with Ambassador Perry uh, from the Corporate Council on Africa, Chris Campanova from Symbian Power, um, Ben Leo from the One Campaign, and Sarah Ladislaw. 
Um, so Andrew, welcome and thanks again for joining us. This is quite a crowd for 1.30 on a Friday afternoon in the summer in Washington, D.C. So I'm guessing that there's a, uh, a strong appetite for information about Power Africa, and you guys have the right person here to finally be able to speak to you about something like this. I've been dying to speak about Power Africa for several months now, and it's now been announced, and I'm at your disposal to answer all the questions that you're going to have. So I'm going to be somewhat brief, but what I'll probably do, let me just give you a general overview of Power Africa and how we got to where we are today. Um, for me, this is probably now this is probably the most exciting thing that I've seen in development in a long time in the United States. And the reason is we're taking this approach that we're taking of this whole of government approach and putting this initiative in the field and having it driven by the private sector, by our host government counterparts, and multiple U.S. government agencies. Multiple agencies presents a huge challenge, but it's a level of communication that we're having and coordination amongst one another, which is already making this a success. When I first joined USAID about 15 years ago, I'm a lawyer by, by training. I was in the general counsel's office, and I was the lawyer for the Office of Development Credit, which, was, uh, which provides loan guarantees for USAID. And I felt during my first few months that I was spending half my time over at OMB arguing with OPIC as to what our mandate was and saying that it was basically turf battles nonstop. And I found it extremely frustrating. But then what I saw was those turf battles were actually forcing us to better define our missions, forcing people to defend their budgets, forcing people to be more innovative, forcing people to be more creative, and it was producing great results. So I think I've learned a lot from that, and I think having the structure that we have is absolutely outstanding. It's going to lead to great results. My only hope is that one year from now, if CSIS has another event like this, that we have the same kind of crowd that we have right now who remains interested in Power Africa. So Power Africa, it emerged from a trip, a high-level trip that was taken with, with folks from the White House, USAID, and other agencies a little over a year ago to Africa, and they were looking at what are the key constraints to growth in Africa in these particular countries? And what they saw all around them, and this was confirmed by several members, of, uh, staff members who I met with on the Hill also, who had a similar trip, was that they were looking at these companies who were working in countries that were enjoying a high rate of growth, but they weren't able to keep up with their power production. They were burning expensive diesel generators and, and that were polluting, you know, polluting and expensive diesel generators. So they need to come up with a solution for this. And that's really what Power Africa is really about, is how we can help keep these countries on a sustainable path to rapid development, at the same time increasing connectivity and, and increasing access for people, and also trying to promote clean energy solutions. Because in Africa, we're not inheriting the old, the old grid that we have in the United States and other countries. We have opportunities that aren't presented to us in the United States. It's very similar to the, the cell phone analogy, where most of the countries in the developing world have kind of jumped over landlines, and we're now going to try to do the same thing for power. The approach that we're taking is a transactional approach. Traditionally, the development approach was spending years, maybe sometimes you know, a decade or more, trying to create the proper regulatory environment so that the private sector would then come in and make its investments. We're kind of flipping that model, and what we're doing is we're looking at transactions that are already in the pipeline or that might come onto the pipeline, large energy transactions that have the, the potential to really be transformational, figuring out what the U.S. government can do from its existing toolbox or perhaps developing new tools whether that's technical assistance from USAID or loan guarantees from OPIC and EXIM, technical assistance from the Department of Energy, perhaps a policy push from the State Department through the ambassador. What can we do to remove those obstacles to these transactions or use our tools to expedite these transactions? Basically what we're doing is we're putting a large carrot on the table for these host governments and we're saying to them, if you want to increase the amount of electricity by one gigawatt, two gigawatts, 400 megawatts, you need to make the following reforms. But we're here to help you. We're not going to necessarily pay for them, but we will help you get the private sector investors. We'll help the private sector have the confidence necessary to invest in your country, but you need to make the commitments. Now, what does that look like? I'll take a country, we can take a country where there's maybe a large geothermal transaction. 
it may be that the host government has never negotiated a power purchasing agreement before. So USAID can come in and we can help find lawyers or, or actually I can tell you a little bit more about how we would do that, but basically provide the government the legal assistance or access to the legal assistance that it needs to negotiate that agreement. At the same time, it may be that the developer or financier needs a guarantee. So OPIC could do that. Or perhaps the seller of the equipment wants a guarantee and Exim would provide that assistance. It may be that the someone needs a feasibility study for this project, so U.S. Trade Development Agency can fund that feasibility study. So it's taking all of our tools and sitting around one table and figuring out how can we push forward. The participating agencies to date are USAID, OPIC, XM, Department of Treasury, USTDA, Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, USDA, uh, Department of Transportation, Millennium Challenge Corporation, U.S. African Development Foundation, and Department of State. And if there's anyone I left off, please let me know, but it's, it's, it's a big number. The countries that we're focusing in right now, and this is a list that could change over time, are Kenya, Tanzania, Ghana, Liberia, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. Now, the amount of buzz that Power Africa has generated I'm sorry? Repeat the countries? Ghana, Ghana, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Liberia. There's six of them. Okay. Liberia and Kenya, I think. Okay. I was proud of myself for remembering all like this and getting all the agencies right. Um, so, so really, but what we've seen already is that we're seeing multiple, not just, not just other embassies and other USAID missions who want to be part of Power Africa, but there's countries that want to be part of Power Africa. But the question is, what does it mean to be part of Power Africa? Power Africa really is, it's kind of, it's, it's meant to complement a lot of the activities that are already you know, doing great things from the US government and from other agencies. You've got the Department of State, which is, is managing the UN's SE for All initiative in Ghana. The Millennium Challenge Corporation has compacts with both Tanzania and Ghana in the energy sector. You've got the Partnership for Growth also in, ta in Ghana and Tanzania. You've got USAID's Africa Infrastructure Program. You've got OPIC and, 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 uh, o OPIC and TDA, which recently launched their, their clean energy facility in Johannesburg, and they've got people in the field there. Um, you've got the EGCI initiative out of the State Department. We have all these different U.S. government in initiatives and programs and activities. And what Power Africa does, one, it brands perhaps the U.S. government's uh, power activities, but it's using existing tools and making sure that these existing tools are talking to one another, are complementing one another, and that we're basically trying to improve the impact, increase the impact they're having. But most importantly, what Power Africa is doing is we now have some, we have additional financing to provide the tools for things like partnership for growth. Um, so along that, along those lines, um, one of the things that we're doing to ensure this collaboration is in Washington, we've got an interagency transactions group and weekly it gets together and we look at different transactions that are already in the pipeline and it's really information sharing. This for me is the best part of what's going on right now. We had a meeting yesterday Someone from an agency mentioned a company that approached them. People from other agencies said, oh, you know, maybe we can actually do a feasibility study for them if they move forward on this. Another agency, you know, can raise an issue. Oh, there might be an issue with them on this. Another person raised a technical point. And this is a type of collaboration. It was almost like a development cabinet that we're having meet on a weekly basis. And it's limited to this sector. But Power Africa is really setting up the model for how the U.S. government development really can be working in the future. Um, why don't I leave it at that for right now for the general overview and to take some questions because my time is limited to 10 minutes and the reason is I'm picking up my 10-year-old son from, from summer camp after he's been gone for a month. So. Is the U.S. going to have any interaction with China in the power of government? Isn't they have We hope so. We hope so. So this is the question that comes up. Is this, are we competing with China? Are we going to be working with China? We're going to definitely be engaging with China on this because our ultimate goal is to increase the amount of power available on the African continent. And President Obama mentioned this. Why well, don't I take a group of questions and then, then I can try to address them. So. Okay. Yes. What, uh, what steps uh, Africa to, to be part of 
What does it take? Okay, let me start. Okay. Another question? Please wait for the, please wait for the mic. for being webcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, as of a month ago, OPIC was talking about a carbon cap. Is something going to be done about that? Okay. Okay. Yes, I'm uh, Dr. Nisar Chaudhry. I just wanted to know, what was the criterion of selecting these six countries out of so many countries, and there are so many challenges and problems okay. all across Africa? Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. Thank you so much for the Power Africa. Uh, my question is, as a global diaspora, I come from Kenya. How is the Power Africa going to involve the African diaspora and the African civil society? Because we attended the global diaspora, the State Department and USID. We need you to involve the civil society to know what you are doing, where we are who are being helped and others. It will help you make it better than just relying on uh, government and those big uh, organizations and companies. Thank you. So, so let, me, let me just answer this first round of questions quickly. So your point is a great one, and that's why I'm going to be moving to Nairobi in three weeks. Our office is going to be based out of Kenya. This is the first presidential initiative that will be based outside of the United States, although I'm counting on one of the people over here to tell me that 150 years ago something like this happened elsewhere. But um, So we're going to be based, out of, based off, out of the African continent. To date, we already have over $14 billion. The president announced $9 billion. Some of it's a little bit of double counting because you've got banks who are providing financing and some of the developers. But just in, in just over about 30 days, we got f over $14 billion in private sector commitments. And I would say that the majority, would, is that fair, Vanessa, say the majority of the private sector commitments come from African, or probably, it's a good share of it. So a good share of it. We have several billion dollars in commitments from African companies, African banks, African organizations. When I mention uh, this idea of providing like legal services, for instance, to host governments, what we're looking at doing is trying to fund the African Legal Support Facility, which is affiliated with the AFDB. So that, so that they would be charged with not just providing legal services uh, to, to host governments, but also doing capacity building and training for government lawyers to, so that they, this will be a sustainable, um, a sustainable endeavor. On the issue of what does it take to be a, a, a Power Africa country, um, this has evolved. A lot of it was determined based on the current transaction, the deal flow. That's why I said this six countries, this is somewhat fluid, but what we're really looking for is that there's a strong host government commitment to make the tough reforms. And that may be cost-reflective tariffs, which is very politically unpopular, or it could be breaking up a utility, but we want to make sure that there's a strong host government commitment to make the tough reforms. Because otherwise, even if we invested billions of dollars in a particular country, it's not going to make any difference in the long run unless they make those reforms. And that's why I want to be very clear that this initiative is about leveraging, it's about coordination, it's about making difficult reforms so that we create a better enabling environment for the private sector to come in. If we can have success with one or two large transactions in a country and to get that success, it required the government to make those tough reforms, then more private sector competition will come into those countries. On the issue of the carbon cap, that's not really, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not the person to, to address that. That would be more, you know, an issue the OPEC and Congress, so. I'm aware, we're obviously aware of that issue, though. Another round of questions? Gentlemen, back there. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence Freeman from the Africa Desk EAR. There's been various uh, publicity figures that have come out since the trip, doubling the amount of energy in Africa, increasing it by 20 million people have access. Uh, could you give me the bottom line figures? What I've read in the mm -hmm. fact sheet is 8,000 megawatts. Could you say what is the current access in Africa? How much this will add? Will it really double? I mean, it seems much smaller scale than being advertised, but I would appreciate the baseline figures. Okay, other questions? Gentlemen here. Timothy Tao, former head of uh, Africa at the Peace Corps. Uh, this is a town where Republicans and Democrats fight each other morning, noon, and night, including in this room. Uh, are you, this seems to be packaged for both Republicans and Democrats. 
Am I correct? You've got all this dealing with the government and an initiative by President Obama, who occasionally gets criticized in this town, but you are opening the door and paving the way and leveraging your word for the private sector. That's something that my Dem Republican friends talk about morning, noon, and night and in their sleep. So, so I'm going to actually, before I take another round of questions, so you, you've hit the nail on the head. We have bipartisan support so far from what we've seen. We, the press on this has been, uh, large, has been almost 99% positive on this. I've seen very little criticism of it because we're doing things the right way. Uh, as I tell people, you know, USAID's mission isn't to create jobs necessarily for, for Americans, but that, the Department of Commerce is heavily involved in this. And if GE is able to sell a turbine in, 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 a turbine in one of the countries, and that's creating jobs for Americans, that's what we want to do. This is about creating jobs. It's about creating access. It's about creating new opportunities. That's why I'm emphasizing this is an economic growth initiative. This is about creating opportunities for U.S. companies and African companies, which creates jobs for people and improves their lives. And all the other benefits of increased access and refrigeration for medications and light bulbs for students to study by, that's all going to come out of this. Um, on the issue of the, of the 10,000 megawatts and 20 million. So that was based on, uh, that's, that's, we're confident that we will hit those numbers. Now, by what year? I think it, will, it was probably by 2020. We were confident that we'll hit those numbers. And that's just based on the deal flow that we're supporting right now. We've had our technical experts and our engineers kind of look at number of megawatts that would come online. But we expect additional transactions to come online. The doubling the number of people in sub-Saharan Africa, that's aspirational. And if we continue this, if this goes beyond the five years, I have absolute confidence that we will be able to do that over time. Uh, all the hands went up now when I said that. How are we going to do it? <laughs> Gentlemen right here. I apologize to people in the back. I'm just going to, my fingers can only point so far right now. So. No problem. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. My name is Steve Meyer. I've developed power projects in Africa. Uh, Andrew, thank, thank you for your remarks, first of all, and for this initiative. Uh, most of the financing organizations you've talked about are concerned with debt and taking risk on the debt but I haven't seen any of them that take risk on the equity. Typically, that comes from the counterparty to the PPA, which often isn't, isn't able to provide the kind of security equity looks for. Is any part of your initiative geared towards protecting equity? Other questions? I'll go toward the back. Someone way in the back who's got their hand up. Just stand up. and. Uh... Walker Williams, uh, Andrew, I'm concerned a little bit. Do we have to go to Nairobi to get involved, or will you have a website, or can we go to DOE? No, so we have, we have a lot, we, we have, well, okay. No, if, so, if we, so we will continue to have an office. I mean, so this interagency transactions group that I'm talking about, USAID is leading, is the, is leading the secretariat for the initiative, and we have a strong Washington presence. So and in fact, what we're looking at doing, and this is more background, is having two one-stop shops. A one-stop shop on the African continent where we have people, and ideally, this is a little bit blue sky right now, but we're looking at trying to develop this, is to have a place where there are people who are familiar with the transactions of all the different agencies. People can come to the office and learn about that and for, to, to accommodate businesses there. And the same type of thing here in Washington to create opportunities. So we've been talking to Department of Commerce, for instance, about having an outreach that really focuses on, on off-grid, mini-grid, and other types of opportunities for U.S. companies. Sorry, I went over here. Thank you very much. How is Power Africa leveraging um, its resources to protect African workers so they have decent work conditions, decent wages, and safety on the job? Okay. Well, I, I'm going to address the development financing question, I mean, so the equity question. So at this point, we're not looking at taking equity but in, in, in the projects themselves, but I'm not going to rule that out in the future if it's something if the right opportunities present themselves, especially for some of the, the smaller, smaller uh, you know, the off-grid and the, and the micro-grid activities. But what we are learning is that one of the biggest risks for some of these deals is sort of the upfront development financing. So we're trying to listen to the private sector and finding out what are the constraints. And that's when I mentioned earlier that we're using the existing tools in our toolbox and perhaps developing new tools. I can't tell you what tools we may have a year from now, two years from now, and we would have to consult with Congress and find out what tools they would, you know, if we can make the case and there's support for it to see if Congress, uh, you know, agrees with this and gives us the authorities to do that. 
terms of protecting African workers, what, look, we're doing fairly extensive due diligence on every partner that we work with. We're developing due diligence protocols. This comes up, like, how do you select which companies you work with? How do you select uh, which, de which deals? We're these are still in development. At the interagency level, we're still sort of sorting out who makes the decisions. Right now, each agency is continuing to follow its existing um, protocols that, that it has, whether it's related to work, you know, the, how workers are treated or environmental implications. And it's still an ongoing discussion that we're having. In the in the back over there, let's see. My name is. I'll, this is, I think, probably my last round of questions. I'll take w one more round of questions. Make it a good one, a hard one. So. My name is Bohendwa. I'm a national of the Congo. Uh, I'd like to know uh, why has the Congo's uh, enormous potential in lighting Africa has been neglected? Because the Congo has massive potential of lighting the entire continent. Why why it takes six countries that can barely provide electricity to the entire continent and neglect uh, that huge potential, you know, from the Congo that has the, cap the capability of light lighting the entire Africa. Why not invest in such a country? Thank you. On this side of the room, in the back. Yes. Amy Hassenberg, Manchester Trade. I'm wondering how you think that Power Africa will affect the renewal of AGOA in 2015. Okay, other questions? Right here. Hi, Carly Hafner from Mercy Corps. How is resilience being incorporated into the Power Africa initiative? Other question? Gentleman right here. All these familiar faces asking questions. Okay. Mike's coming. Mike. As uh, as others, I'm surprised that you know uh, Francophone countries are included. I'm sure you're going to re reconsider the list. My question is about a toolbox. Um, is it necessary, uh, if I understand it correctly, there's a large amount of export subsidies. Is this really a necessary instrument? It might be, they may be uh, trade distortionary. It's like the Chinese uh, selling solar panels. Uh, uh, it's not exactly a change in paradigm if you continue export subsidies, or else there are other ways to, uh, to support uh, the initiative. Thank you. From the one right here. Yeah, go ahead. My name is Ronke Luke. I'm originally from Sierra Leone. Um, so I find it kind of interesting and amusing that all of a sudden all these, um, there's all this private African money that sort of come out of the woodworks to support this effort. Because when we try to raise money in Africa, they give us ridiculous interest rates, 20% um, at the bank um, for projects. And there was a project that um, we were involved with uh, fairly, like last year, a couple of years ago. In the end, you know, young folks, young um, uh, entrepreneurs, we raised the money through crowdsourcing. Um, you know, there was no private venture money or any of the, those kinds of things. So maybe when you talk to these private African financiers, they might want to put up some money to, you know, young people or entrepreneurs on the continent. Um, as opposed to maybe this is a bit of a PR thing they can get associated with um, a big high profile US venture. So, Okay, I'll try to address a few of these. So, so the issue of the Congo, I assume you're talking about the Inga Dam, right? So if people know the Inga Dam has the potential to, for I think about 40, 40 gigawatts of power and it's, it's viewed, Grand Inga potentially could um, uh, you know, provide power to 500 million Africans. And, uh, you know, uh, it's just something that we're not ruling anything out at this point. I'm not saying that we're going to go and start building Grand Inga. Same thing with other countries, the Francophone countries. There was no intent to exclude Francophone countries. In fact, I was responding to emails today and I was sending things out to people from Senegal, from Rwanda, um, from, from, uh, from multiple other countries, including uh, in Malawi, others, to asking our own staff to start responding to some basic questions because we as a group, as an interagency, have to figure out what are the exact criteria that we're going to do. But as I mentioned, it's going to be important that there's a host government commitment to make the difficult reforms. Governance is key to success. But we also have limited resources. We need to demonstrate success. If we spread ourselves too thin, we're not going to have any success. And even among six countries, it's limited resources that we have. $7 billion sounds like a lot of money. A lot of that's financing. But even $7 billion, if it was real hard appropriated dollars, 
is just a drop in the bucket for the amount of money that it requires to have really a you know to, to really have a huge impact on the entire African continent. Um, on the question of well, why aren't the Africans investing in Africa already? Why do they need this? And I can speak to that just based on my past experience when I was working for the Development Credit Authority Office at USAID. There's tons of liquidity all over the world in developing countries, but the same reasons that you're mentioning are the reasons that often these deals aren't happening. High interest rates, they're not getting the terms that they need to make this deal marketable. There might be a lack of familiarity with the sector. If you're dealing with a person on the other side who's never negotiated a power purchasing agreement or has never managed something before, you're not going to invest your money. And that's what the idea behind Power Africa is, is our tools are not meant to be government subsidies. They're meant to help the market, you know, adjust to the market conditions so that we can create an effect, an impact, so that, so that we don't need to provide this assistance, this assistance in the future. Once that government official's negotiated a power purchasing agreement, they won't need that million dollars from a U.S. law firm or an international law firm to come in and train them on how to do that. The idea is that as other people see what the private sector is doing and as they are engaged in these transactions, they won't need this. They won't need this type of assistance. And we can focus in other areas. We can focus in other countries. Okay. One last question. Just, I hope it's a good one. So that I got to go get my son. So sorry. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent are you using the internet to coordinate among the donors and the agencies and people doing the projects? Well, we're doing better than the internet. We're picking up the phone and we're calling them. We're talking with them and we're meeting with them. <laughs> so I was over at the World Bank today. We talked to the African Development Bank. The African Development Bank is really our lead partner on this. And they're investing heavily in it. And any type, anything that we can do to be working with them, that's how we're, we're managing this. Thank you, everyone. And again, please promise me if that I'm back here a year from now, you all will show up again and still be interested in this initiative. Andrew, thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, really terrific and chock-a-block full of, of information. Um, why don't we bring our panel up here? Um, and we'll, we'll get, get started. Great. Um, well, once again, thank you to our panel for, for waiting. I think that gave us a lot of great information, um, uh, kind of the approach, this transactional approach, rather than trying to build the perfect regulatory structure and waiting for people to come. I wonder if there are some drawbacks to that um, as, as, um, as we, we talk through this. We're going to turn to our panel today, which is a mix of private, um, private sector advocacy and independent analysis. Um, to hear from them what, how important is this initiative in terms of what they do, what might be some of the missing elements where we can, we can build out, what is it that we need to be looking for in terms of success, and, and how, how is this going to help w what they're trying to do. Um, we have, uh, to my left, I'm not going to go through extensive biographies because you have them. We have Ambassador Robert Perry, who's Vice President um, for Programs at the um, Corporate Council on Africa. Corporate Council hosted a major, uh, a major discussion in Tanzania that the president hosted the president at this discussion with business leaders. Um, obviously, uh, uh, Ambassador Perry has a good perspective kind of from the broader uh, a private sector community um, beyond some of those who are already engaged. Their mission is trying to reach out um, to, to pull, uh, pull new players into that. Um, we also have Chris Campanovo, who is uh, Director for Business Development, I believe, at um, Symbian Power. Uh, Symbian has, uh, has had a strong presence in Tanzania. The announcement of Power Africa was made at a Symbian plant. Um, interesting uh, partnerships that they've had already with the U.S. government in various ways. Uh, I think Chris is, will say a little bit about what this initiative means, how those partnerships have been working, 
um, where maybe some of the opportunities for expansion on this, on this um, initiative are. Uh, we then have uh, Ben Leo, who is um, had, sorry, director of uh, global policy at the One Campaign. And One has been, uh, has been playing a very important role in raising this issue of energy access and, and the tremendous uh, development burden that it, it places on Africa. Ben has also been working with the U.S. Congress, I believe, on the Electri Electrify Africa Act. And so I think can say a little bit, too, about how this initiative and the Electrify Act, uh, Africa Act mesh together and what might be missing and, and kind of what are the critical next steps for the Congress, for the administration, and I think for all of us here to make that happen. Finally, we have Sarah Ladislaw, who's um, a co-director of the CSIS uh, Energy uh, program. Uh, Sarah has done a lot of great work on uh, on climate change, and I think the timing of this initiative coming right after President Obama's speech on climate change offers up some of the dilemmas. Someone mentioned the carbon cap over here. What are some of the the dynamics with within that? The trade offs, uh, the constraints in terms of of, uh, of climate change and the, the Power Africa initiative. Uh, each of our speakers will talk probably 10 minutes or so max, um, even shorter, um, and we want to leave ample time for comments and conversation with the audience. So Ambassador Perry, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here and join you this afternoon uh, to launch of this important event, uh, the Power Initiative in Africa. Uh, its importance, I consider it transformative. We all know about uh, projected uh, population growth in Africa. So in terms of production, that's one key element that African countries certainly will have for them in their advantage moving forward over the next two to three decades. What has been missing in terms of competitiveness is adequately priced and available electric power. This initiative is a step in changing that. I think there are projections that China's population will level off over the next three decades while Africa's increases. So what I see in the future is Africa with both the population and electric power to be a competitive producer for the global supplies. This initiative uh, brings together both private sector interest in the market and U.S. government support in terms of risk mitigation for that investment. Make no mistake, investment in Africa is risky. Companies are in business to make money, and they do it by assessing risk and offsetting risk. And the role of the USG here is to help them manage that process. Uh, I think there have been a number of agencies working in this area, sort of individually over the past decade, certainly USAID and MCC, each in their respective areas. USTDA has helped with feasibility studies. But this coordination that we have now, I think, will be a game changer. Reaching out, focus on the policy commitment of African governments is essential. If you ask yourself, why didn't this happen 10 years ago? I think that's the answer. The policy commitment was not there. If it does not come in the next two to three years, country to country, companies will not put their money in Certainly not a second time. They might make a first investment, but if they lose on that, they won't follow up with more. To get where we want to be in 20 years, we are looking for companies to go in with initial deals. They work for everyone's benefit, and then they go a second time, a third time, and three or four more join them, just like has happened in China over the last 30 years in terms of U.S. corporate engagement. I think the same thing can happen in Africa because essentially you have a much freer market in many of the countries. And I think that dynamic will change and expand over the coming years also. Good thing about this initiative is that it has the capacity, and I think you see that from some of the players, of incorporating multiple sources of fuel. Many countries now depend upon very expensive diesel fuel. That will transition. Uh, company Countries discovering uh, natural gas will draw upon that, I would expect. But there's also other sources of renewable power. I just want to share with you some information uh, from the International Energy Agency. 
It surprised me when I read it, but so that's what I, why I want to share it. As global renewable electricity generation expands in absolute terms, it is expected to surpass that from natural gas and double that from nuclear power by 2016, becoming the second most important global electricity source after coal. Globally, renewable generation is estimated to rise to 25% of gross power generation in 2018, up from 20% in 2011 and 19% in 2006. Driven by fast-growing generation from wind and solar voltaics, the share of non-hydro renewable power is seen doubling to 8% of gross generation in 2018, up from 4% in 2011 and just 2% 2 in 2006. There's tremendous potential there. And I mention that on the renewable side because most of the deals I think we see in this early stage are focused on uh, thermal power, but it's not limited to that. I think certainly when you're dealing with large population centers, uh, cities of a million and more, probably thermal power solutions are the most economical. But you have population spread around in smaller towns and villages where off-grid solutions powered by renewables uh, probably are the most rational answer to provide that access to power to people, that thousand people living in that village, that they have power, that they can work as long as they want and are not limited to either the information or actual work in terms of the sun. And so this has a possibility of opening up uh, a lot. And I expect that uh, many American companies will jump in. Many, like my colleague here from Simeon Power, they're already there. They started in uh, Tanzania with an MCC compact uh, for transmission lines, and from that they invested in a power generation plant. You will see much more than that. On Monday, I had a call from uh, two Nigerian companies because there's a tender up in Nigeria for privatization of uh, 10 plants in the Niger Delta. They were looking for American partners. I reached out to some CCA members to put them in contact, and some of them will follow up on that. So I expect an explosion of interest, and I'm glad to see that the USG is stepping in to help companies mitigate that risk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob, and we'll come back to you in Q&A. Chris, let's hear from the Symbian who is at the heart of this thing. Sure. <clears throat> thank you, um, Jennifer, and uh, thanks to CSIS right, too closer. Um, for hosting this event. Obviously, it's timely. Um, we're extremely happy to not just be here, to, but to have been a, a central part of the very least the, the president rolling out this initiative. Um, just to give you a little background on our company, I think it's, it's helpful just to put it in context. Um, we started out as an engineering procurement and construction firm in Iraq in 2005, where we were implementing uh, Army, Army Corps of Engineer contracts, transmission lines, um, <clears throat> and went from there to Afghanistan, where we worked on a 100 megawatt um, diesel-fired power plant in Kabul. Um, and then when MCC put out the tender for the work in Tanzania, um, we sort of jumped around and said, wow, this is great. Let's go somewhere where we're not getting shot at. Um, and um, as it happened, um, some of the, the key management in our company had been working together um, in Tanzania since the early 80s. Sorry. <clears throat> um, so it was a perfect opportunity. Um, we had relationships that went back um, 20, 30 years. Um, we knew the country, we knew the context, um, and uh, thankfully we were successful and, and uh, secured two major contracts with um, MCC, one for the construction of about uh, 1,000 kilometers overhead distribution lines, 33 kV, 11, and, and LV, um, and then another for the um, uh, construction of 26 substations, mostly Greenfield, um, all across Tanzania and as well as in Zanzibar. Um, we took advantage of that opportunity um, to purchase um, the Ubungu power plant, which is where President Obama um, spoke last week. Um, it's all sort of blurry right now. 
Um, and then developed also another two additional plants in Tanzania, which were emergency power plants, which were operating in Dodoma um, and Arusha. So um, we're now, uh, we've got about 217 megawatts of installed capacity in, in Tanzania, which um, in the grand scheme of things, when we talk about uh, needs and, and capacity, sounds very small. Um, but in the Tanzanian context, it's actually quite significant, um, particularly when they've suffered low Load shedding for the last three years, um, which has left huge parts of the country without power, um, primarily because the the water in the dams um, has, has simply not been there. Um, whatever the, whatever the reason, um, whether it be climate change, whether it be um, you know freak weather patterns, the last few years um, there just hasn't been enough rain. So when the water in the dams go down, they can't run the hydros. Suddenly there isn't enough capacity on the grid, so you start load shedding. Um, and, and that, that's what happens across Africa, um, which is why we see over and over again um, governments that are paying ridiculous amounts of money on, on emergency power projects, on diesel gensets, which are polluting and ridiculously expensive. Um, and, but they need the power, um, essentially, to keep the economy moving um, and to keep people happy. It's, it's, it's an economic issue. It's a political issue. Um, and and it's, it's why it happens. And, and we're, we stepped in to try to fill that gap in, in capacity. Um, in Tanzania, we also um, have two very interesting biomass projects which we're implementing with um, our JV partner, KMR Infrastructure. Um, these are um, small, as Ambassador Perry was saying, um, off-grid. <clears throat> Actually, they're not off-grid. They're uh, isolated mini-grid projects. Um, and they reflect sort of an ethos of our company, which is, you know, as much as we're in these projects to do, to do business, um, we're also creating jobs. Um, we're also developing local communities and, and, um, and the economies there. Um, we, you know, through these projects, um, we expect to employ hundreds of people on bamboo plantations, um, be develop outgrower schemes. Um, so the community itself is all part of this process of, of generating electricity, um, and we're doing it at about half the price of what Tenesco is paying now um, in order to power these mini grids with with diesel gensets. Um, we're also looking at projects in Malawi um, to develop uh, also renewable energy projects there, and we're, we're pretty far along in the, in the development process there. Um, and then we're in Nigeria, and we're in Nigeria big time. We were uh, part of a consortium that, that won um, a tender in the first privatization round for a 972 megawatt uh, plant in Ugali, um, and we're now looking at the second round to see whether there are assets there we're interested in acquiring. Um, we are developing a project in Ghana. We're, we're, we're pretty much in every one of the Power Africa countries now or um, have, have plans to be. So uh, that's, that's sort of the, the, the background behind the company. Um, you know, one of the, I will make one extra, one additional point about how we do business. Um, as I said before, we, part of the ethos and part of the, the core business plan for us is to um, do development as much as we, we, we run businesses. Um, and as a result of that, uh, that ethos and how we translated that in Tanzania anyway, um, we built a training center in, in Morogoro, Tanzania, um, where we've now trained upwards, I forget the numbers, but it's easily between two to 400 Tanzanians um, to build overhead power lines um, to an international standard. Um, we did it in partnership with the Linesman College in Idaho, the Northwest Linesman College, um, and we did that out of our own money. I mean, that's, that was... Um, not part of the tender. Um, we just decided that that's the way we ought to do business. We employed most of those people, and whether we build another overhead line in Tanzania or not, and believe me, we would like to build more, and we have plans to do more, um, we have left a workforce there that's 100% qualified to continue that work into the future, no matter who's there doing it, whether they're Chinese, whether they're German, whatever. Um, and, and we do that because it's, it's the right thing to do, and obviously it helps our core business there. I mean, we're, we're respected because we do that, and and, and that helps us on, on a number of fronts. Um, but, you know, we are giving something back, I think, in a significant way. Um, so that, that's sort of the general. And now I'll, I'll just, a few comments on the, the Power Africa initiative. Um, you know, obviously we're thrilled by this. Um, as, as, as we're an EPC contractor, we're also an IPP, but we're also a developer. So as I said, we're looking at developing a number of projects in, in various countries. Um, 
And the, the, the most enormous benefit we see from this is getting a, a coordinated USG approach to um, all manner of the deal, the elements of making a deal, of doing a transaction. Um, so, you know, we've been involved working with USAID, working with others um, as, this is, as this is developed, and we, we've, we've seen it work. Um, we've, we've got a deal, I was talking about the, um, uh, the biomass projects, um, which we're financing through OPIC and some other equity providers. Um, and, you know, we've seen the process and we've been involved in the process and I think there are real results, um, certainly in the Washington end, because there's a certain urgency and say, well, here's a deal. We've got a U.S. investor. Um, they've got a pipeline. How, how can we make this happen and how can we make it happen faster? So we're, we're seeing that already. Um, <clears throat> I think the in-country piece of it is going to be extremely important. And um, as I understand it, I think it's going to depend on the country. But the idea behind um, at least the USAID element of, of Power Africa is to put people within ministries, um, assuming that they're, they're invited and, and requested. And I understand Tonesco is eager to have somebody in the ministry. And that person becomes the belly button for pushing deals through, pushing transactions. Um, as anybody knows who's tried to do deals in Africa, um, the bench isn't always deep, and it's hard to get the attention of the guy you need in order to move something forward. Um, and there may only be one guy who can do that. So if you've got somebody who becomes um, not only the local government focus person, but also the private sector focus and the US government focus as to how to get that done, um, that person's gonna be able to move transactions forward. Um, and obviously there's, there's also this, this important piece of capacity building, whether it's negotiating a PPA or working um, sovereign guarantee issues, w whatever it is, um, that person who sits there is gonna be vital. And, and Andy will be working with them and the folks in, in, in Washington will as well. Um, and, I, and I think this, this element is key. Um, and it was something that came up in the president's remarks at our plant. Um, what, what he said was, um, and the message he delivered to Tanzania, the message he delivered to other African governments involved in Power Africa was, you know, you got to move fast. Um, th this, is, this is an urgent issue. Um, it is a key constraint to development, not just economic development, but social development, whether it's education, whether it's health, across the board, it's, it's about power. Um, and, and the more that, um, the more bureaucracy there is, the more red tape there is, the slower things move, the harder it is to attract investment to Africa. Um, everybody knows the potential. I mean, I think, you know, we all look at whatever report, whether it's in The Economist or whether it's, you know, whoever it is who, who written these reports talks about the potential. And we talk about the cell phones. We talk about all these, these analogies. Um, but we all continually butt our heads up against this, this, this sort of, I don't want to call it lethargy. Let's call it bureaucratic inertia. Um, it, it's sort of a, a bureaucratic muddle where you're just trying to plow through and move things forward. Um, so to the extent that the U.S. government can have somebody on the ground, within the ministries, trying to move these things forward, and leverages the political influence of the embassy, um, of the White House, of the aid mission, whoever it is, and, and push things forward, I think you're going to see real progress in, in, in all of these countries. Um, there were a couple of points raised in the Q&A earlier, and you know, I, I think I just wanted to, to sort of pile on on a few of these things. Um, I think someone, someone mentioned um, equity and, and the difficulty in, in managing equity risk and, and finding equity. Um, and I'm going to pair this to the, the comment that was raised about diaspora and how do you take advantage of the diaspora. Um, you know, those two things go together. There is, there is an enormous amount of equity that's out there in the diaspora. I mean, I think what you're finding, what we've found certainly in a place like Nigeria, is that Nigerians are coming back to Nigeria in, in order to invest, in order to run funds, in order to invest. You know, we have had, as, as Ambassador Perry said, you know, there are Nigerian firms who are coming to him and saying, look, we want to we wanna be part of the, the NIP. We want to be part of this next round of privatization. How do we do it? Who can we do it with? And they're coming to us and they're saying, look, we've got the cash. We just don't have a technical partner. So, you know, we're, we, and, and so we're finding that there is, that the capital is out there. People want to invest. Look, frankly, I think a lot of these projects, the IRR is high enough so that people are willing to assume a certain level of risk that they wouldn't assume other places. Um, so we find that the equity is there. 
Obviously, there's a certain amount of management with, with regard to counterpart guarantees, and, and we're hoping that we're going to be able to work through a lot of that, and that's going to be a focus of the, the, um, the folks involved in the Power Africa initiative. Um, <clears throat> the, the final point, and th this is, um, I've probably gone well over my 10 minutes, but I tend to babble. So um, the, <clears throat> the, the final point is not necessarily the most important, but it's, it's one that I think plays in here. The, you know, as I said, the IRRs can be high um, the, um, because there's risk, okay? Um, and, and most of that risk, there's a lot of risk in terms of owning and operating um, and, and um, securing the revenue off the, off the project, getting your money from your off-taker. Um, but there's just as much risk, certainly not in, in orders of magnitude the same, but in the development process. I mean, I, I've got a number of projects in development that, quite frankly, you know, from one day to the next, I don't know if they're going to go anywhere. You know, I can, I can, on Tuesday, I can be like, yeah, we're steaming ahead with this. We're going to get a PPA. We, we know this is going to happen. Um, but then the next day, you know, it's, I'm 180 degrees, and I don't know, I don't know where we're going to go with it. Um, and, and that's the nature of developing power projects, particularly in Africa. So to the extent that the U.S. government, <clears throat> through Power Africa, is able to do two things, it would be enormously helpful to investors. And, and the, the first is, is to, is to mitigate some of that development risk um, through providing development capital. And, and not just say, and it's one thing to say, um, well, yeah, you can go to USTDA and, you know, there's money in OPIC and, and we want to do that. But, you know, USTDA and even TDA will tell you, I don't know if anybody from TDA is here, but, you know, it's hard work. Um, there are a lot of restrictions on TDA money, um, and it can be very challenging to get that, that money to, to do development. It can take over a year. Um, so if you're trying to develop a power project, you can't necessarily wait a year. You don't want, don't, you can find that development money elsewhere, or you just fund it off your balance sheet. Um, so we need to find a way that we can streamline these processes within the U.S. government to be able to put up development capital to get these projects moving. Um, and, you know, the second issue on, on development risk, um, you know, I think the, the, the standard rule has always been about 10 percent um, and that you get a development fee of 10 percent, which essentially covers your risks. Um, that's not always guaranteed. It changes. Um, and I think the U.S. government, through this process, has to find a way to, to, to price that risk better um, because everybody knows that the, the projects are a little higher. And I'm now probably getting a little too technical on this issue, but it's, I, th I think it's a key element that, that this initiative has to, has to work through. Um, but in the end, you know, obviously we're, we're thrilled to have been a part of this. Um, you know, we've gotten incredible exposure. I'm getting calls from, from people who want to work with us on this and that. Um, and, you know, I've been on the phone ever since I got back. And, and I think there are just enormous opportunities. And it's not just for Symbian. I mean, it's, it's for any number of U.S. companies that are willing um, to take advantage of this, this enormous opportunity that's, that's, that's in Africa and that the, the president is, um, I think, entirely accurately focused focused on. So with that, I'll shut up and uh, hand it over to Ben. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. It's, it's great to be here. And uh, Chris, if you went a few minutes over, that's great. You can have a couple of my minutes because ev everyone wants to hear from people that are actually doing, <laughs> doing the tough work on the ground. Um, I'm, um, I'm extremely encouraged by the turnout here today. And, uh, and the different, the, the wide spectrum of people that are brought to this issue, including on, the, on this table up front. And, and uh, I think the reason for it is because this issue is at the heart of everything, you know, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the broader development process, et cetera. Um, and at the one campaign, uh, it's um, uh, advocacy and grassroots organization of just under three and a half million people worldwide uh, with a healthy contingent in, on the continent itself, um, this is something that has really, really resonated, if we're talking about energy poverty in, in our parlance, uh, has really resonated with our members um, uh, over the last, say, year or so. And why is that? Well, we try to focus the, the policies, programs, and work uh, that we engage in on what ordinary Africans, African businesses, and African governments are actually saying. What are they calling for? And we try our best to try and focus on those issues and see what we can do to help and drive. And on this particular issue, uh, if you look at Afrobarometer surveys, 
One in five Africans say their most pressing concern is infrastructure with a healthy contingent on that on power. If you look at African businesses, uh, right around 50% say this is a major constraint to their operations. If you look at African governments, this, the energy sector, power, access, uh, affordability of electricity is in almost every single poverty reduction strategy paper or other kind of country blueprint for moving into middle-income country status by 2020, 2030, whatever the, the overarching vision is. And you see multilateral bodies, whether they're on the region or elsewhere, uh, that are heavily, heavily engaged on this issue. If you're talking about the African Union and January of 2012, coming out with the Program for Infrastructure Development for Africa, the so-called PETA, with a very heavy component on energy, or the UN Sustainable Energy for All issue, or, or initiative. Uh, this is like, at the center of, of the discourse. And we're absolutely thrilled that the US government is engaging on this issue. Uh, and, and largely, it's because it, all, it, it, it touches all the issues that we focus on. So, Going back to Afrobarometer again, just under 40% of Africans that are surveyed say their most pressing concern are jobs or, or income-related issues. Well, this touches uh, that in a major way. It touches health, it touches education, it touches agriculture if you're talking about irrigation or, or cold processing, cold storage, all those kinds of issues. So in basically, what we hear regularly is there is no path out of poverty or to prosperity without power, full stop. So you have got to engage on this issue. Now, um, the US government is coming to this party probably a little bit late. Uh, other actors like the African Development Bank have been all over the space for many years. World Bank, uh, others, uh, obviously China. But the US government can have a major, major impact in, in this sector in supporting those country-led plans and businesses, et cetera. And I emphasize supporting the country's own strategies in this context because that's where it's got to start, that's where it's got to end, and figuring out a way to plug into those with uh, participating private entities. Um, and, uh, and, and there's a number of plans that, that have come forward on this. So Power Africa, in our view, is, is a fantastic start, is a fantastic start. Uh, a, bold, uh, a bold announcement, um, but also what can only be a start. So it is um, very ambitious in, in its scale and its scope, but compared to the need, compared to the demand, it remains a very small piece of what has to happen. And obviously there's many players in this space, uh, so every, everyone has a role to play. Um, but uh, as all the actors and all the participants to, to Power Africa focus on execution over the next 18 months. And you heard Andy before say that uh, making sure that they have some wins under their belt is absolutely essential, of course. Um, so, so while all the US government and others move to execution mode to make sure that this announcement actually has real tangible impact on the ground, not just tomorrow, not next year, but sustainability and commercially, commercial viability over the next, say, 10 years, need to be thinking about how to go to scale even more. So this, in, this announcement is, is quite interesting um, compared to previous US government announcements, and I've spent a number of years in, in the government and have been a part of some of these announcements, uh, the transaction-specific focus is really refreshing, and uh, it's going to be challenging over the medium term uh, to how it continues to harness and focus all the different vehicles and resources within the US government to support this effort. So it cuts both ways in some context. Like if you take a look at, say, a PEPFAR, very, very, very explicit metrics that flow throughout the US government and everyone knows what their targets are to drive towards. This, some of that is there, some of it is not, um, which is, is going to need to be addressed as you go to scale and continue ambition, to ratchet up ambition over the medium term. So that's where the Electrify Act um, uh, that was introduced in Congress uh, a couple of weeks ago comes in. 
And for us at the One Campaign, it's absolutely a critical. Everything that we do, if we're talking about in the U.S., is bipartisan. It's got to have support from the right and the left because we know from painful practice over years that that is the only way that's, that policies, programs, or whatever kind of uh, action is going to have staying power. And in this case, uh, I think all indications point towards a very bipartisan, very big tent type of model on this particular issue. And the Electrify Act, uh, Act Electrify Africa Act, is one political vehicle to, act, uh, political vehicle to actually drive that forward and uh, to help make sure that there is staying power, not just in terms of putting wind at the sails of this particular administration, but whoever follows, whether Democrat, whether Republican, will also have the rope, will have the support to continue these efforts, and as I mentioned before, to scale them. So beyond that, one of, one of the things that, that we're very focused on now, again through this prism of scale, ambition, and delivering for what African people, businesses, and governments are asking for is, what are some of the impediments to, to fully uh, harnessing the, 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 via, the, the assets of the U.S. government? And a number have already been mentioned, so I'm not going to touch on those. You know, one was equity, some of the things that Chris just mentioned in terms of project preparation, not necessarily even feasibility studies, but project preparation, which is a very high risk part of the deal cycle. There's a number of those kinds of things. But a couple of, uh, of, of additional pieces relate to the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which uh, was a modest part of, of the announcement from President Obama uh, in, in Cape Town and then uh, some subsequent remarks in, uh, in Tanzania. If you look in a, uh, across a number of, uh, for a number of different reasons, uh, and I'll try and be quick and wrap it up and, and, and go, because like Chris, I tend to, to ramble on. Um, the OPIC needs to play a, 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 a very significant part of any effort. A number of actors have very important parts to play. But there's a couple of things that OPIC does that are very unique for this space. One is it has longer tenor in terms of the financing. So there is a, a more of a match with the requirements for the sector, which is very medium to long term in, in terms of the financing needs. Uh, the, some of the, the risk mitigation and the insurance products are very important in this space as well. Um, in addition to that, though, in an austere budgetary environment, there is no way in hell that USAID is going to be able to get billions of dollars out of Congress in the foreseeable future to be able to support this. And frankly, in many ways, outside of the capacity building and outside of some of the credit uh, um, uh, the credit guarantees. I don't think you want USAID to go big in this space because it has to have a commercial viability nature to it. And the private sector is going to have to be central to it if there's going to be sustainability. We've, it's just painful practice and lessons that have come from that. There may be some cases for uh, off-grid, microgrid, things like that where subsidies in the medium, in the near term may be required, but if you're talking about big scale, uh, USAID is not going to be your, your, your leading tip of, of the spear. An organization like OPIC is. OPIC is sitting on $15 billion of deployable capital. So the upside to scale in this space is going to have to be, is going to have to rest uh, uh, very heavily on, on OPIC. What are two of the constraints to OPIC? One is it just doesn't have enough bodies. It's a small, it's a small agency doesn't have enough deal teams to, to, to help drive some of these transactions. So that's got to be addressed. The second thing is one that was actually brought up before uh, on the, this emissions cap. Now, the scale of, of uh, the magnitude of this issue is such that it's going to take a mix. To hit what the demand is on the continent, it's going to take a mix. It's going to take a mix of renewables. It's going to take a mix of non-renewables. And when there is an environment where renewables are the commercially best solution, the viable and the resources are there, then absolutely, I think everyone would wish that that is the preferred model of of generation and, and then feeding into to, to transmission. There are going to be some cases where that might not be the case. Uh, whether it's nat gas, we, you know, or, uh, or basically nat gas uh, uh, is going to need to be a part of the mix. If you look at what the UN says, uh, the IEA, uh, UN Sustainable Energy for All, other 
uh, actors that have opined on this from a very credible um, uh, authoritative stance that everyone calls for a mix. So um, in this case, um, having OPIC be able to support the mix of solutions that African governments are themselves asking for and trying to pursue, I think is important. Within that though, a strong an emphasis on the renewable aspect as well, wherever, wherever possible, wherever appropriate, uh, is, is gonna be really important. So whatever the type of approach to address this, this constraint at the end of the day, I think there's many, many ways to do it, many, many ways that can be win-win and, um, um, and uh, um, bring all parties to the table, whether it's development groups, environmental groups, businesses, et cetera. I think there's a way to skin that cat, uh, and, and we hope that that, that that will be able to come to fruition at some point, and, and look forward to engaging with a number of parties on that front. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Ben. And Sarah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much. I just wanted to say thank you to Jennifer and, and the rest of the group here for allowing me to be on a panel with such an amazing group of people doing very, very interesting work that is totally different from what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the things I wanted to do uh, in sort of answering the question of why am, why am I up here, what does this have to do with energy and climate change, uh, you know, it's interesting for me because I actually feel like while um, most of what we've heard about the Power Africa initiative so far has to do with, you know, it being transactional, which everyone likes that word. It's really sexy and it sounds like you're going to do stuff. And, and I think that's something that we see as, as sort of being politically palatable for most of the big initiatives that, that we see going forward. I actually think what people really wonder about the initiative of is, is it strategic? Does it have staying power? Is it something we're going to do for a while and is it going to work? And I actually, you know, when we were talking about this internally and looking at the initiative, I actually think there's a number of ways in which Power Africa makes a lot of sense, um, not only with what we see in terms of the energy and climate change goals uh, of this administration, but also in terms of how they've adjusted to sort of a, a changing energy landscape. And so what I thought I would do is maybe um, add some, some food for thought to the conversation. I can't do what these guys did. It's amazing. I don't, I, I don't operate in that business. And I think that all of those, those comments were tremendously insightful. So I'm going to sort of go back up to the 30,000 foot view for a moment and say, why does this match with what the Obama administration is trying to do? And I, you know, from my perspective, I've watched this administration for a long time, um, basically trying to look at a world where you're trying to find places where transformative change can happen, both from an economic perspective and a technolo technology perspective. And a lot of that is low carbon driven, but it's not unpragmatic. And so when you see what the Obama administration just sort of announced within, the own, within their own sort of climate change strategy, you see a world in which they, they definitely believe in trying to drive low carbon energy sources, but they also are rarely uh, aware of the fact that there's a lot of new uh, unconventional oil and gas resources out there and hydrocarbon based resources that they need to sort of be able to compete with. So how can we look at this? this as being a strategy that makes sense with some intellectual underpinning that gives people some confidence that maybe it's a good idea for us to be spending uh, a, a, a large amount in, in sort of US dollar terms, uh, government money at a time when, uh, when that's not, a lot of that isn't, isn't around to be spent, uh, and how it may leverage uh, additional funds. And I, so I just wanted to touch on a few key issues. You know, uh, so why power Africa? Well, like Willie Sutton said, why do you rob banks? It's where the money is, right? When you look at you know, the big global issues out there to be tackled, power generation issues in Africa, this may be the time where things are different. Uh, there is an exuberance out there in the terms of the economic growth that you're starting to see uh, in different parts of Africa. I, I don't fundamentally think that a transaction-based approach versus regulatory or reform, reform approach, I think we oscillate between those two things uh, throughout the history of U.S. development efforts. Um, but that's not to mean that one is right and one is wrong. We've never tried it this way before in 2013 during this time in Africa's development cycle. So, so there's a lot of hope that you know, can potentially be predicated there. Um, but of the 1.3 billion people around the world that don't have access to electricity, 47% of those people are, are in Africa, right? And if you actually look at most of the literature that's being done in this issue, it's in a small number of countries within Africa, right? And if you go out to 2030, you're actually seeing a good deal of progress in terms of uh, connecting more people to modern electricity uh, uh, resources. But a lot of that, even though there is, in aggregate terms, progress being made in Africa, 
a lot of that isn't actually happening in Africa to the same extent that it's happening in other places. So if you're going to pick a problem to sort of put your shoulder behind and push, this isn't a bad one. The other thing that's often a criticism of the strategy, which I actually think may potentially be uh, the brilliance behind it if we're able to do it correctly, is, yeah, $7 billion, $9 billion, that's not a lot of money. You know what it is a lot of money? $16.6 trillion, right? That's the amount of money that's going to go into the energy sector for the electric power supply services side between now and 2030, according to just a normal reference case view of the future. The one thing that's not determined inside those dollar figures is how much of that comes from different companies or different governments, how that money gets spent, how it's divided among fuels. The point is, is that there's a lot of money out there in the energy sector. And when you start to look at where the competition for who's going to be spending that money gets broken down in, a lot of that money is going to get spent in rapidly emerging developing economies and developing economies, right? So the question is, how do you spend small amounts of money, you know, which in the Power Africa initiative sort of is, is sort of a comparison between the, you know, the seven billion that you're putting on the table to the 300 billion that might, you know, eventually be needed to achieve uh, a universal access within the region. Um, how, how do you use the, the sort of the combination of the private sector and the public sector within a U.S. perspective to try and create investment frameworks where U.S. companies have a competitive advantage? And so people who were talking about how we partner with other places uh, like the African Development Bank or like China or like other, you know, countries with specific interest in getting a foothold in those markets, instead of thinking about it as a small amount of money that doesn't really match up to the need, think about it in terms of what, what would you do and what you as companies would do to try and get a foothold in some of those emerging markets and how do you make that possible? And I think that's actually the real sort of uh, exciting part uh, of the initiative. Um, the other thing is, it's not necessarily bad for climate change. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of sort of subtext here about, gee, this Power Africa initiative because it's coming from the Obama administration really only means that it can be clean energy based, right? Because the Obama administration cares about doing something about climate change, and in their climate change strategy, they've basically said they don't want to finance coal-fired power generation units in uh, in in countries other than sort of the less the the least developed countries, and only when there's not sort of an economic uh, uh, um, uh, disadvantage to doing, uh, to doing an alternative. Well, the intellectual underpinning behind a Power Africa initiative actually looks at the vast majority of the places where you might spend that money being in rural applica applications. And a lot of those remote, remote rural applications being places where maybe those alternative technologies um, are more competitive. I think that's a case that has to be proven and proven on the ground. A lot of people can say that, but it needs to actually be proven in practice. Um, you can't really prove the counterfactual either, so you, you, you actually have to go out and do that. Um, but I think if you look at sort of the basic assumptions behind what it would take to actually achieve universal electrification uh, around the world and not only in Africa, we had Conde Mkela here when, when we were doing the Sustainable Energy for All initiative and basically said the greenhouse gas emissions really are you know, less than 1% increase of where we would be in 2030. Um, now the presumption there is that that that, that case of, you know, uh, of a lot of this rural electrification coming from uh, non-fossil based energy sources uh, is actually, you know, pr proves to be true. Um, I, I think that the really important part about that maybe giving this initiative staying power is that if you're going to do something about climate change, you're going to have to prove those cases. And the best places to prove those cases are in places with economies that are growing quickly. Um, that's not here. Okay, that's in a lot of other places around the world. And, and rather than looking at that as being sort of an ideologically driven uh, 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 exercise, it could be looked at as, as a way of trying to catalyze some of this new innovation. So um, the other thing is, the last point I was going to make is sort of this, this sort of ma taking advantage of energy resources uh, uh, in sort of a shifting energy landscape. I think one of the least sort of mentioned within sort of development circles, but certainly gets a lot of attention in my world, uh, are places in Africa with significant energy resources and whether or not, one, the money from those resources are being used appropriately to sort of develop the electricity infrastructure. Uh, within those countries, but then two places where new finds have been uh, discovered, especially uh, of natural gas in particular, and figuring out ways to use that as a catalytic effort uh, uh, for development within within those countries. Um, act fast. A lot of gas out there. 
So I, I think that one of the, the really important things to do is to make sure that you keep some of these, these development prospects, especially within the oil and gas uh, side, uh, in context. The oil and gas landscape is changing dramatically, and the competitive landscape is changing dramatically. And so being able to get that mix right between what governments can require of companies um, to not only build out that infrastructure and utilize those resources now is not is not the same conversation as it's always been. It's a, it's a very sort of competitive uh, landscape out there. So we can talk more about that uh, as well. But that's what I wanted to say real quick. Great. Thank you very much. And again, lots of uh, food for thought and a lot of different perspectives on that. I think we've got about uh, 35 minutes now for um, questions and answers. Um, so we'll take, a, we'll take rounds of questions again, once again. Um, and we'll begin with a gentleman here. If you could uh, wait for the mic and please identify yourself before you ask your question. Uh, yes, I teach government at Georgetown. Um, uh, let me ask the question I was going to ask uh, earlier, which is, where is this seven billion dollars coming from, and what's and is it likely to detract from other programs such as humanitarian programs in Africa? Sarah could answer that, I think, or perhaps Ben. Let me ask Sarah. Okay. A, a reporter from The Voice of America. Uh, my question is for Mr. Kempenover, if I get your name right. And uh, uh, Mr. Leo mentioned that compared to China and other actors, U.S. comes to Africa a little bit late. So I'm just wondering, could you uh, tell me from the business uh, perspective, do you see a competition from China there? Thank you. Hi, this is Gene Eckhart with uh, National Electrical Manufacturers Association. So I was just wondering if, um, and I don't know who on the panel might do this, um, could let us know if, if there is already an existing, say, portfolio of prioritized projects that these six countries have identified, work has been done on it, that they know what they need in their countries. Thank you. Uh, Rick Sincere with Scribe Strategies and Advisors. Uh, with a couple of exceptions, what I hear from the panel is unbridled optimism about this initiative. Do any of you have any doubts or fears about unintended consequences or failure? <laughs> Not yet. Anyway. <laughs> Let's see, why don't, we, why don't we go down the panel, and if you want to pass, just say so and tackle the question. Uh, would you? I'll take the one up from over here. Okay, good. Uh, the Niger Delta holding, holding has a tender out for 10 power plants, uh, July 19th deadline. Uh, these are existing plants. Some of them have been updated in the government policy to privatize, and Nigerian companies, consortiums are looking for U.S. partners. That's the only situation where I know something immediate coming up. But I imagine there are other opportunities in other countries also. Thank you. Question or uh, tackle the ones you've seen most fit. Um, I think, just to respond to your question, I think um, my understanding is the, the Power Africa team, um, they're focused on a number of projects that they're trying to push forward. Um, I, I would expect there, uh, you know, that things are as transparent as, as possible, and you know, there's certainly an entree there to say, well, who are the guys you're talking to? Um, because everybody's, you know, if you're looking for Exim Bank financing, you're going to need to source a lot of materials right here in the U.S. So, um, you know, those are opportunities. Um, uh, the two questions that were sort of directed towards me: the, the competition from China. Um, <clears throat> look. 
you know, I, I don't see it as competition. I mean, look, as an, as an EPC contractor, you know, we obviously compete with Chinese companies um, and have competed with Chinese companies. And in fact, we submitted a, a bid today for a contract in, in Tanzania. And I'm sure there are Chinese contractors who are doing it. And it's tough for us to compete with Chinese contractors um, as a U.S. company. We're more expensive um, at the end of the day, but we also tend to use uh, equipment, which is more reliable. Um, but you got to pay for that, right? And so um, I think overall at the macro level, we, I don't see it as competition. I think the, you know Chinese companies and, and the Chinese government has done amazing things in Africa. I, I mean, in terms of roads and infrastructure. Um, but there's so much work to be done that it, it's not really a matter of competition. Um, the fact is, you know, we've come to, come to late to the game in a way um, because, as everybody knows, um, the development projects and the infrastructure projects in Africa is, have been an element of Chinese foreign policy. So um, they've been able to provide very low interest loans um, to get this stuff done by Chinese contractors. And, and, and we just don't have that system. So we're more expensive. It's harder. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's just a different kind of an approach to doing development in Africa. But you know, overall, I wouldn't call it competition. There's just so much work to be done um, that there are certainly opportunities for, for partnerships. And, and you know, everybody could pull off a piece and be doing work together. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, in, in, in Tanzania right now, they're, they're, the Chinese are constructing a gas pipeline um, up from Matwara to Dar es Salaam. Well, you know, everybody who owns power plants is looking forward to that happening because there's going to be more gas in, in Dar es Salaam to run our power plants. We don't have to run them off of jet fuel. Right, so um, that's that. That's an element of um, you know not necessarily cooperation, but um, you know it's shared infrastructure that everybody will benefit from. Um, doubts or fears about unintended consequences or failures? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> no, of course. I mean. Yeah, the, the the one thing is, you know, Ben 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 and I are both familiar with this from from our sort of careers in government, um, and, and he even mentioned it. Uh, lots of initiatives come out of the U.S. government. We've been involved in them, and and um, and there's always the danger that you know people lose interest. And it was a great initiative. Everybody got really excited. It was super sexy, and then you know ah, we're, uh, the money just doesn't show up. We're not funding it anymore. Things happen. But, but I think in this context, this is something that's too important, and it's, it, it's become such a signature initiative and has so much bipartisan support um, that I, th I think the risk of that happening with this initiative is, is fairly low. Um, all you've got to do is look at PEPFAR, right? I mean, that was a Bush administration initiative that's been going strong for quite some time because it was the right way to do it, um, and it had the support of African governments, of civil society, of the development community, everybody, and, it, and it's continuing to, to go fairly strongly. So. Um, no, I'll hand it over. Sorry. I think most, most of the key points have been hit on. Um, maybe just one or two of things that, to, to add on additional. In terms of where the money is coming from and is there any risk on humanitarian programs. So obviously for our organization, we, we work on many different issues, uh, global health, agriculture, a number of other things. So we have a number of priorities and this would be a, an issue that we'd be very focused on. Uh, in this case, we haven't seen uh, any tangible, um, any tangible risk in the near term. Uh, it, we'll all kind of see how it plays out over time in terms of how much legs this uh, initiative uh, gets and how it transforms over time. But um, most of the mo most of the the resources that were announced are uh, don't require congressional appropriations. So they're not grant resources. Most of them actually will, will make the U.S. government money. Uh, of that announcement, I would suspect, not knowing the financial engineering for all the commitments, that this thing will be net positive to the deficit uh, because of profits coming in from XM and profits coming in from OPIC and a very, uh, very modest portion coming from USAID, the African Development F Foundation, and a couple of others, um, which is actually quite an interesting model in the austere environment in which the government uh, in this town is operating in. Uh, and that feeds into some of the, the bipartisan support that you'll probably see on this. Um, so so I, I don't see any risk right now, but, but, um, but it's something to watch going forward uh, in subsequent stages. Uh, on the, the uh, China competition, 
So the one thing that I just, I think Chris um, hit, hit on this uh, adequately. The one thing that I would say, though, is I didn't necessarily mean that the, the, govern the U.S. government is late to the continent, just late to this particular issue, late to this particular issue. It's been, you know, obviously a leader on, many, on so many other issues on the continent, but behind the power curve on the power sector. <laughs> Uh, ton intended, or pun intended. Um, in terms of unintended consequences, one of the things that, um, that or, or challenges or risks, I guess, instead of unintended consequences, there are so many risks on, on some of these projects that, that from the one campaign's perspective, we're quite worried about. Um, and I'll just mention one or two. Uh, first is now that this issue is, is gained so much prominence in this country, in the development context. Uh, it's been in the space in Germany and France and Japan and other places, but not so much in America, that, um, that there are some successes and that this continues to go forward and to be incorporated into the core, uh, the core um, sections of how this place does development. And for all the reasons that I mentioned before, in terms of just responding to what everyone wants, this is like at the center of the Venn diagram. Like, how could you not be working on this issue? So if there are a couple of projects that, that don't hit the mark, fail for whatever reason, very worried about what the consequences could mean over the medium to long term. Um, uh, I'll, I'll stop at, at, at that point. Two really quickly, yeah. I, I if I if I seemed overly uh, excited about the initiative, I was doing a good job of trying to be positive. Um, I just meant it made sense. Um, I, I don't think it has any greater likelihood of succeeding than any of the other one of these we've seen in recent memory, right? But I don't think that means that it has a good chance of failing either or you shouldn't be doing it, right? And so I, I, there's some really good analogies for what could happen that would not go well with this, right? I mean, we have some analogies on the energy side of doing project-based spending and, you know, in, with, with lots of exuberance that didn't go so well that was very, you know, politically picked up on uh, in this town and has done a lot in terms of what we're able to put into, uh, uh, you know, R&D spending on the clean energy side. So project-based funding is always a really, a really dicey thing to do um, from that perspective. You know, the thing that I get worried about with these initiatives, and this is because of my government background, is anytime you make like a focal point initiative that the president cares about and usually is connected with a trip, does it suck energy away from other people who've just been doing this work for a long period of time, right? Or does it actually, you know, get people catalyzed around a new sort of direction and a new way of thinking about doing something? And I think this is why it's really, really, really important to not only say, you know, I'm having an interagency meeting every single week to make sure that we're all talking to each other, which is fantastic, but I think the vast majority of the American public would be shocked that you weren't doing that in the first place, <laughs> is talk to people who have money that they want to invest in large quantities on a very, very, very regular basis. And I have no doubt that that's happening too. And also just be really transparent about, you know, the strategic thinking and the creative thinking that you're putting into these processes. Because it's not like any one initiative like this is gonna crack the development nut. I'm not in the development world, so that's not, I mean, I don't mean to say that glibly, but, but you gotta keep working at it, right? And being transparent about, you know, the intellectual discourse that's going behind these things, I think is, you know, is actually a really helpful thing for, for everybody to get involved in, even, you know, from a political standpoint here in Washington. And finally, the, the competition with China thing, I think, yeah, absolutely. And I hope there's more of it. Americans that respond really, really well to competition unless they respond really, really badly. But you have to choose <laughs> one of those. And I'm going to vote for really, really well. So I think that we should figure out what our competitive advantage is and go for it. Thanks. Just on the risk side, too, I mean, uh, you know, so much of this relies, as, as Ambassador Perry said at the start, from the response from the African governments. And, you know, you've got to wonder why they have not gotten the act together on the power sector for decades. Uh, when for decades it's been this monumental obstacle. And some countries, and Kenya is one of them, I think, has been working kind of incrementally, but it's taken a good uh, 10, 15 years for them to get kind of the regulatory structure in place. They've taken some hard decisions, and Andrew mentioned kind of cost-reflective tariffs um, that are politically difficult. You look at, you know, Nigeria, every Nigerian president comes in and makes power there, that's going to be top of their platform, and it quickly bogs down into vested interests and the difficulty of 
disentangling, um, you know, the, the, the privatizing the sector, un uncoupling various pieces of it together. So one of the big risks is maybe the ambition of putting a kind of a transactional advisor into one of these ministries and expecting this young, energetic American to try to turn a massive bureaucracy around in a, one, in a way. And that focus on the transactional, that, you know, a project-by-project -project approach is important, but uh, to, for it ultimately to hang together, you need a kind of a sector-wide reform and these difficult political choices that need to get made. And if you start to hit that wall or the bureaucratic morass that you were talking about, you know, you can see kind of some of the energy kind of leaking out of this a little bit and, and too many of that and, and the kind of the good feeling and momentum that's happening right now um, begins to, to fade away. So it's always great to st start this out optimistic and I think, you know, what is it that will make this work, what's needed to make it work both from the U.S., from the U.S. Congress, from the private sector, and from African partners, and African governments, and African constituencies. And, you know, engaging civil society, I think, in these countries and saying what's at stake here and what's the opportunity and how do you, you know, what's the importance of keeping, holding your government to account um, to make this work um, is, is incredibly important as well. So creating a constituency for power within Africa that's organized, vocal, and politically connected, I think, is, is really important. Uh, we, uh, let's take another round of questions. Now, are we going to go to the... Yeah, we'll, well, he got a shot at the first, but okay, we'll go with you again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have an advocate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is Dr. Nisar Chaudhry. And, and I find uh, Christopher in this jam-packed room the most optimistic and the most realistic person. And my question I would like to ask him, the uh, countries in Africa and any third world countries, the Chinese are there anywhere and they are going everywhere virtually. Their quality of work and the prices are relatively cheaper. And then they have sharpened their skills to navigate their course everywhere in the world. In, 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 in the countries you are dealing with, you talked of bureaucracy hurdle, red tapeism, and the third is uh, corruption. How do you navigate your course and overcome these hurdles while competing with Chinese? Uh, because your quality is superior, you're generally because of that, the contract is of a higher price. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Raymond Maro. I'm from Tanzania and I'm volunteer for East African Community and I'm also a student of international relations. Uh, my question goes straight to Mr. Christopher, who has been in Tanzania, and uh, talking about Power Africa, especially powering the electricity in Tanzania. Uh, I have been in Tanzania for almost five years, and issue of electricity is really critical. And since you have been there from the Ubungo plant power, what strategies have you laid down? Because the common citizens in Tanzania up today, they are, their daily cry is the electricity. It shows that the government has failed. And if your company has been there working now like for four years, what strategies are you laying? Because many people in Tanzania now, they are focusing on Chinese projects. They say the Chinese ones come here, they don't talk. They give the work and you give the timeline, you see something is happening. But now in Tanzania, people are thinking even suggesting the government to privatize the Tanesco company because has been an issue with Tanesco, with the parliament, with the private companies on the electricity. Obama coming to Tanzania in my own country, I was privileged to see really America is going to help Africa or we are just having another talk shows continuing. Thank you. There's your skepticism for, um, <laughs> um, and then the, the lady on the aisle. I, I ha I'm Elizabeth Harbaugh, I'm a reporter with Climate Wire, um, and I have another question from 30,000 feet. 
Um, something I'm still kind of unclear about um, is, I mean, you talk about the importance of a portfolio, Mr. Leo, of course, and I'm just, I'm still unsure how much of that portfolio is going to be renewables and how much is going to be oil and gas. Um, when you look at the White House fact sheet, a fairly small proportion of that money is specifically earmarked for renewables. So I guess wonder realistically what are we looking at for renewables as we go forward with this? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Hank Cohen. I'm associated with uh, Contra Global Corporation, which, like Symbian, is a pioneer investor in power in Africa. We, we're generating power and selling it in five African countries right now. And we're extracting gas from Lake Kivu in a new, new technology that we invented. And we're now currently looking at uh, de uh, gasification of LNG as a low-cost way of getting rid of heavy fuel oil. So we're very active. But to get to my question, I seriously doubt the, uh, the value of including Ethiopia in this six-country mix. Uh, we've been going there every year for five years, offering to invest in private power generation, and we've been refused each time. It's a Marxist-Leninist regime that has absolutely no interest in private investment in power. So why did the United States choose that company? I hereby make a motion that we switch to Cote d'Ivoire right away. <laughs> All in favor. Chris, do you want to start off? Yeah. Sure, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I'll start with Ethiopia. <laughs> I mean, look, maybe, maybe this is a way of trying to move that forward. I mean, we've both been hearing probably for years now that that's going to change, right? Um, and <clears throat> there are moves afoot for the Ethiopian government to try to start allowing IPPs. And um, maybe, maybe, and I, again, I'm just guessing, you know, just like you, that it's the idea is to try to incentivize them to do this. Hey, the money's there. Let's start trying to, trying to do some projects. Um, I'm going to go down the list here. Um, how do we deal with the issues raised by competition with China? And I'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, you know, we're a U.S. company, um, and we can't do things that other companies can do and that other companies do do, you know, whether they're Chinese or whoever they are. And, and essentially um, what we have to do is we develop relationships and maintain those relationships. Um, and, you know, we, we also do it through how we do business. Um, and that has real value, I think, in a lot of African countries because I think it is um, in stark contrast to the way a lot of Chinese contractors operate. Um, and, and I really do believe that that makes a difference. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, making the business case for, for, for being a responsible business and sort of investing back in the communities and doing things. And that's, that's been real valuable for us. Um, and I think that's how we've managed that issue. Um, but, but make no mistake, it does take longer. Right? I mean, there are certain things that you can get done um, as, as, as another company that we can't do, and so that just takes a long time. To get our invoice to that top of that stack, um, we've just got to be in there nonstop saying, pay, 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 pay. <clears throat> Others don't have to do that. There's a brown envelope. It makes it a lot easy. Um, what are we doing in Tanzania? Um, look, you know, what's the strategy? We are continuing to do everything to, to keep the lights on. Um, we'll, we'll be in a position where, you know, we haven't been paid by Tonesco for all the reasons that you are very well familiar with, um, you know, that, that are contributing to the calls for privatization of Tonesco. And, um, and, and, it's, and it's difficult. I mean, uh, the organization needs serious reform. And I think even people within Tonesco will tell you that. There's some great people in that organization. Um, but it, it hasn't, it, you know, it hasn't, 
and been up to par. I think, you know, this this issue where we talked about cost reflective tariffs um, that Andy raised, um, that that's an important element in um, in cash flow and revenue for for Tenesco. And so what we do is like, you know, we've made commitment to the president. We're going to keep the lights running. So you know, we've had to manage it off our balance sheet to to put fuel in the gen sets to to buy Jet A for our uh, Abungo plant, um, and we've kept them running even when we haven't been paid by Tenesco. Um, <clears throat> and, and again, that goes to the point here, which is sort of how we're, 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 we're staying in there. You know, we, as a result of the way we've done business in, in Tanzania, um, we've signed an MOU with the government to develop a 400 megawatt plant in Mtwara. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of gas in Nazi Bay. Um, and we want to take advantage of that and be able to power the south. I mean, part of that project is to build over 650 kilometers of transmission lines to go from Twar all the way across the south to Songea. Um, and so, you know, that's that's a that's a strategy to try to generate power and push it into the grid from the south. So, you know, we're there for the long term. And so, you know, that that's 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 been our um, strategy as an investor. And and we just we just keep the lights on and as much as much as it hurts sometimes. <laughs> um, can, can I, I just want to jump in the question on the portfolio about renewables. I think someone raised in the back there. Um, yeah, I mean, just to stress the point that, it, that there's got to be a mix. And, and just when I, I went down this list, Ben has this really great list of um, all the African countries installed capacities um, and just in uh, average tariffs, right? So the retail tariff for residentials. Um, and, and this is the real challenge with renewables. Um, I just went down this list and I said, okay, how many, how many countries have a tariff which is over 17 cents. Now, I'm pulling that out of the air because it, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to do a renewable project for a, for a tariff less than, less than 17 cents, right? I mean, that's, it's a, it, that's a trick to, to get the IRR that's going to that's gonna attract investors. There are only six out of 26 countries, right? So how do you make a renewable energy project commercially viable when that's what their retail tariff is, right? The retail tariff is way lower than what it's going to cost me to develop a project and sell electricity at a rate that makes it commercially viable. So, you know, unless you subsidize the tariffs heavily, and there's a lot of instruments out there that enable us to do that, um, whether it's through the AFDB or the IFC or whoever it is, you know, these projects really aren't, renewable energy projects aren't right now commercially viable. I mean, you've got, um, you know, they are in certain circumstances. I'm not going to say across the board they're not commercially viable. So your mix at the outset is, is by nature, just the, the sheer economics of it, your mix is going to be low. Um, and, and that leads to a point I think that, that Ben was making. Yeah, I'm sorry to drag. I'm like I'm a sort of moderator's nightmare. But the the the, <laughs> the you know when we started when we started talking when we started talking about OPEC, real important issue is carbon cap. And I didn't raise it in my issue before. I was trying to stay away from it. But it's you know it's controversial. Um, but you know OPEC is this enormous amount of debt that's there that we could take advantage of that we want to take advantage of. But you know, if I've got a six or seven hundred million dollar project, or whatever it is, and it runs off of gas, I don't have access to OPEC because of the carbon cap, right? So where? So it, it sort of asks this question. You know, this goes back to will this fail, right? <laughs> and I think, you know, that's a that's a real risk because there, there's a, a major commitment here. But as we've been saying, the gas is there. There's gas in a lot of these countries. And we've got to find a way to be able to take advantage of that gas in a way that's commercially viable and we're able to finance it through Power Africa. Um, it's possible. It's going to take work. But I think these are, the, these are the real challenging issues that people have to focus on. I'll shut up now. On the carbon cap, I want to give you an example of something that worked, I think, without too much U.S. government support, multi-country multi project. And that was a pipeline from Bolivia taking natural gas to Sao Paulo. So they worked through three countries, Bol Bolivia, Paraguay, I think Argentina also, and Brazil to deliver it. It was done by Enron. I know they got a bad name now. But they figured out how to mobilize private capital to get a project done. It meant working with governments to get the regulatory framework right, addressing, I don't know how they did it, uh, environmental concerns to run pipeline through the Pantanal, but it got done, and it's making money. I think you can find similar situations in Africa. If you get a market that is willing to pay, which he's getting at with the tariff thing, uh, then 
investment bankers can come in and do things that maybe USG agencies can't. But there has to be the demand and a market price for it. Really quickly on the OPEC thing, you know, I, um, so you either believe that in some of these places where, where access to electricity and what's your definition of access to electricity is really important uh, here, uh, is, is, is uh, commercially competitive through uh, non-fossil based energy sources or you don't, right? And so some policies uh, allow you to test that theory while others just make it more difficult for people to access money on the other side, right? And so I think that one of the big questions here is, is the OPEC cap a vestige of a different time uh, when we were basically looking at building up support within various U.S. government agencies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We were doing it in a lot of different ways, and OPIC was applauded as loudly as it's being derided right now for exactly this cap. Um, and so the question is, you know, how do you, how do you sensibly um, try and incentivize low carbon energy technologies in different places? And is that necessarily, is that, is that something that makes sense in this new framework that we're seeing rolled out in a lot of places? Or is it something that's just making it problematic? And I think that's an ongoing debate, obviously. Um, but, but again, we sort of go back and forth between, you know, this world where we actually believe that some of these, you know, these technologies and these sources are cost competitive in these rural and remote applications or they're not. And I actually think we need to prove that on a case by case basis in lots of different places uh, over and over again. And that's what competition in the private sector uh, are about. So I think the go role for government is to figure out how to best play in that and not be overly prescriptive. But. I just, I just want to add one or two sentences on, on uh, points that, that, that Sarah made. Um, in terms of, A, what we're talking about in ter uh, for access and then where we should, where the U.S. government and others should be focusing. So um, as always, it's complicated or complex or, or whatever, but uh, yes, it is the rural and, and off-grid areas. It's also urban. Uh, so this isn't. This should never only be a rural access issue because if that's what you're talking about, then maybe solar lanterns might be a nice stopgap. Uh, if you talk to the people in the villages, they'll say thanks for the solar lantern, and that's not enough because that's a cell phone for me for a little bit of time. That's not transformational. I want to be able to start a small firm or do whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, so what, where, where the government should be focusing and what access how access is defined, I think, is really important. But when I said a mix uh, before at, at the at the very top, uh, I also was was uh, intending um, or intimating a mix in rural, urban, uh, grid, off grid. These all these kinds of things. It's across the spectrum, uh, and the the issue from from our perspective is just simply let's not handicap ourselves in terms of being able to push on certain issues because it's going to be appropriate and customized according to different circumstances across the geographies, across countries, across market dynamics. So uh, it's going to require a lot of creativity and a lot of different vehicles is our point. We are at time. Um, and uh, this is just being fascinating to me. And thank you all so much for, for joining us. I do hope we can take Andrew up on his uh, suggestion that we reconvene in a year and uh, take a look back. Uh, but I hope we'll be working on this in the interim um, and uh, uh, drawing on your expertise through that process. Please join me and thank you very much.